everybody, this is Eric. I just wanted to give you a quick warning about today's episode. Uh, we are talking with a survivor of sexual abuse, so this episode will contain descriptions of sexual abuse, as well as language that might be triggering. Uh, so please just keep that in mind. Welcome to Uncomfortable Conversations about Culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Rachel. Hey, y'all. And Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. TGIF. Yeah. It, it is Friday. Amen. Uh-huh. At least when it releases, maybe yeah. not when you listen. So. Right, right. Uh, welcome to today's episode. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here. Uh Today, we are, it's going to be a heavier episode. I'll just get that out there. I think there's a little bit of tension even in this room just because, um, the, well, let, let me let me set the table a little bit with kind of what spurred some of this. If, if you haven't seen it in the headlines in the past, um, oh, you know, the, the, the Michigan State doctor, Larry Nasser, uh, was accused of sexual assault, multiple accounts child pornography, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, This summer, a documentary came out on Netflix called Athlete A, which documented this. Um, And so, I mean, we watched the documentary. Uh, It's 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 kind of excruciating to watch it, to see, like, what what was perpetrated. Um, And, yeah, I mean, does anybody have any thoughts on that? before we continue yeah I mean, you mentioned michigan state he was also the doctor um for the u.s olympic you know right. teams for, for That's right, a long time and and the documentary gets into more than even just how terrible all this is but just a bigger cover-up type mm-hmm. of um mentality and in the system mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. saving and, face yeah and i think it's one of the one of the things that just stuck out to me the most is that this is i i I'm not into gymnastics at all, but I, I am into USA and I remember, you know, specifically every time it's like one of our pride points, I think mm-hmm. is, is the women's gymnastic team and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. so I, I remember even me wrestling with seeing these girls win and like my, my feeling of like Harry Strug, who was highlighted in it and, and things like that, win Olympic gold and like that heroic moment. But then mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. now as I watch this, it feels like I, I can't celebrate it as much mm-hmm. because you know some of the backstory um, of abuse in multiple levels and layers. And so even- mm-hmm. Or what for, was going on at the same time. Yeah, so even for me, I'm like still processing all mm-hmm. of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually growing up did gymnastics for a long time until I was like 14 years old. And um, I remember seeing this come out on the news and just seeing all these gymnasts that I just like looked up to and like really was like, wow, these, these girls are amazing. Like I just wish I could be like them or like, you know, do that. And then to see like how just like all that happened and just kind of see my perspective of everything just change and just yeah. how horrible that was for for the girls that I just like, you know, were like my heroes, like in athletes, like it was just kind of like heartbreaking and scary too. Cause when you're in, in athletics, like there's a lot of people, adults in your life that are really impactful, like your coaches and like, you mm. know, people that are doing like your doctors and all that kind of stuff. They're very impactful for your life. And so it just kind of gives you that just like sense of just like, Oh my goodness, like that happened to them. How could they, you know, know? And they're so young and just, they weren't even protected from that. And it's just kind of, it was scary for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and to say all that, Jess, you had an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with Lisa Ashton. I did. Who Larry Nasser was her doctor when she was at Michigan State. Mm. Uh, so um, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about like what we're in for. Maybe just a, just a, a, a if you're if you're ready <laughs> to, if you can even come up with the words. I would say be ready for a very raw, honest conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, Be ready to ask yourself the question, like, what do I do next? What's my responsibility Mm -hmm. in this issue Mm -hmm. um, of sexual assault of, I mean, it plays into such a bigger picture, but um, 
Lisa has such a, a powerful and strong story. I'm, I'm excited for you guys to listen to her journey to healing mm-hmm. yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's coming up next. All right. Well, today we are here with Lisa Ashton and we are talking about um, a, a tough subject, which mm-hmm. I'm really um I'm excited to get into this because this is important, an important space that, you know, we don't really make a lot of room to talk about. And so um, we're talking about sexual assault. We're talking about sexual abuse today, how it infiltrates our lives and affects us and how Lisa has personally navigated this in her own life. So thanks so much for being here, Lisa. Thank you um, for having me. Today, we just we want to bring more awareness to survivors and to cultivate more empathy for our listeners um, who might not have exposure or may have exposure past this podcast. So mm-hmm. we're just so thankful that you're here to have this conversation with us. And so this kind of came up because um, personally for me, like I turned on Netflix like a lot of us do on the weekends or at mm-hmm. night. And um, I saw Athlete A. And if our listeners haven't um, watched that, it's it's a documentary on Netflix, um, Athlete A film. And it's this documentary around Larry Nassar. And that's somebody that we're going to discuss today. And um, it's a, around USA Gymnastics. And it's this whole documentary about all these women, children, Um, at different stages in their lives that were being sexually abused by somebody that was in a position of a helping relationship, a Mm -hmm. safe person, a person um, almost in a power position over them to be able to help them do what they needed to do. And so this documentary follows a couple of those girls' lives as they're processing through it. It shows the trial. Um, I would just encourage anybody to take a take some time after this conversation and watch that. It's hard to watch. It's disgusting to have that feeling. It's It gives you a gross feeling, but it's important for us to know that these things are happening. And um, so Larry Nassar was this doctor. And in the end of this documentary, we could talk about that just the whole time. Um, But he was sentenced to 60 years in federal prison after pleading guilty to child pornography charges. And then in addition, he was sentenced to 175 years in Michigan State Prison for um, after pleading guilty to multiple counts of sexual assault. And the end of this documentary, um, they give this number 500 women, 500 girls were sexually assaulted, sexually abused by this man. And Lisa, you're one of those 500. I am. And so um, just for everybody listening, we have, we've had a couple conversations before this and I, I'm giving you permission. I'm saying it again. I want you to be raw and honest. Um, I hope you feel comfortable. Like this is a safe place to share your story and thank you for being here. Um, so Lisa, let's get Let's get to it, Jess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you reached out to our group, the Uncomfortable Podcast, um, a month or two ago, and I was surprised that just that you wanted to have this conversation, that you were ready to have this conversation. So tell me a little bit about that. (laughs) Certainly. Well, I was surprised too, Jess, to be honest. But uh, briefly, the way that came about is... You know, since since this story came out in the news in 2018, and because of so many events that collided in my life regarding this topic, I had a deep sense that someday I'd be sharing my story mm. in greater ways. I just didn't know when that would be. I didn't know h- how that would happen, but I just sensed that. And so that's been something, um, you know, in the back of my mind for the last few years. And then about a few months ago, 
I um, was taking some time journaling and just reflecting on a seminar I attended about sharing your story. And I remember um, just kind of hearing this thought in my head of, Lisa, what if you allow others to bear witness to your story and just see what wow, happens? Wow, that's powerful. And so I thought, okay, you know, and immediately, you know, I turned it into a prayer and I said, okay, God, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, I feel like I'm in a season of discernment in general. And, um, and then <laughs> fast forward to early July and my roommate and I wanted to watch a uh, Netflix, you know, movie or documentary. And I said, let's, let's watch a documentary. And so we're just flipping through the channels and all of a sudden I see the word athlete. I'm like, Ooh, you know, cause that, that interests me. And I, I clicked on it and it's like my heart sunk. I was in shock. And I said, cause who oh did my you goodness. See? I said, there's my doctor. Mm-hmm. And my roommate's eyes are like huge. He says, what are you talking? I said, that's that's him. That's him. I said, I can't believe they did a documentary on this. But of course they would. You know, Mm -hmm. I just didn't know that it was in the making. Right. Um, I knew it would come out, you know, because it it made history. Um, Mm -hmm. So as I as I watched that and and I got to the end of it, I just had the sense of it's time. It's time to share my story. And uh, what better place than on a podcast called Uncomfortable? <laughs> I thought, uh, yeah, that yeah. was just the first it thing that kind of popped clicked. in my head. And, and I didn't really have reservations. I think deep down when you know something that you know that you know, you can't help. You're compelled. Mm-hmm. And so I just Absolutely. took a step. Yeah. Great. So before we get into more of your story, I, mm-hmm. I want you to share because you said some really powerful things um, earlier about sharing from a place of vulnerability versus exposure. And I think Mm -hmm. that would just really help the people listening to know where you're coming from in your journey Mm -hmm. of healing. Yeah, no, I can definitely explain a little bit about that. And um, I first was kind of given uh, language to this. I was listening to Terry Wardle, and he's a friend of Christ Community, and he's he's led our soul care conferences, and he was kind of explaining this. And so how I received it was um, when it comes to, to sharing our story, sometimes we wonder, is it appropriate to share a story, and what does that look like? And to share out of a place of vulnerability would be to share out of a place where you've experienced healing to the point where you can say, you know, I can speak of this from a place of strength. Mm -hmm. I can speak of this from a place of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Not gratitude because I'm grateful I was abused, but gratitude out of how I saw God meet me in those moments Mm -hmm. that were super dark. I experienced I experienced Jesus. You know, another way you can look at it is, is like when you're walking through something dark and all of a sudden the light crashes in, when you feel like you're, you've come to a place where the light stays, it's okay, maybe I, I can share this now and, I, and I, I'm not gonna feel, you know, shame or nakedness or something uh, with my listener. I can focus on being listener-centered instead of me-centered. Whereas um, exposure is kind of those places that still feel messy they still feel undone and and you know there's healing more to do not that I don't have more healing to do but it's just you haven't given it the time that it needs and you haven't quite maybe experienced that that touch of God or or that you know that divine inner intervention that that you need when it comes to healing does that make sense yes that's great yeah so take me back to your days of being an athlete at Michigan State, because that's kind of like <laughs> where you started. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd be happy to. And in fact, I didn't even think about it, but I'm wearing green today. So <laughs> it's so appropriate. Go green. <laughs> I am. I'm unapologetically a Michigan Spartan and uh, love that I got to play for them, played volleyball, late 90s. So now you know how old I am. But um I, I was a, a volleyball player, and unfortunately, my freshman year um, got a back injury that was significant enough that the athletic department, the medical team, um, wanted to bring in the best to start treating me. And I began to hear about this Dr. Nassar guy that was just like the best of the best. And if you could see him, you were seeing this Olympic doctor. And in fact, in 1996, if you watch the Olympics and Carrie Strug nailing that vault, he was on the on the screen helping her um, when she was pulled off, you know, of those of that competition. So he was worldwide. Mm-hmm. And well known in the sport. Well known yeah. and respected. And um, I was having a specific issue at the time where I had pain from my neck all the way down through my back, through my butt, 
through my leg and I didn't have a really good range of motion. And so they set me up to see him. And um, when uh, it was, it was, I think it was after practice and, and mind you, you know, when you're a college athlete, you want to get better and you want to get better fast yes, you because it means you want to play, you want to get back on the court because I, you know, I, I had a, a lot of work to do to improve my skills. And so you have that drive to get better. Mm -hmm. And when you're told there is a, a doctor that is there to help you get better, you're like, absolutely, yes. I'll do whatever it takes to right. get better. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, re I remember it. He took me to this room and, and it was after hours. And so we were the only two in there, which again, it started to feel a little, you know, uncomfortable, like after hours, only two in here. And then we sat down, and I remember um, he pulled out this red book, this really old red book, and he opened it up, and he pointed, and it was a, a picture of the anatomy of a woman, and he pointed to these areas of muscle, um, basically like in the vaginal crotch area of a woman, and he's like, these are the areas that I feel we need to work out so that your pain will go away and you will heal. And I remember looking at that thinking, are you serious? <laughs> you know, but right. he had questioning. Yeah, yet I'm with the best I'm with doctor. The, I'm with the best doctor, and everybody I trust recommended that I see him. Um, and so now I'm digging deep for <laughs> courage. Like, okay, Lisa, you can do this. You know, your teammates have done it, and uh, so he's now using all this medical language and description to wow me. You know, and he also throws in, well, if you if you feel uncomfortable you know, say something, okay, <laughs> who's going to say that? And so then he threw me these shorts with Velcro on the side. And then, you know, you, you get you get ready and he comes in and he actually at the time he did use uh, lubricant, which if you l watch the documentary, sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't, sometimes with me he did, sometimes he didn't. But all of it just added to an experience that was highly uncomfortable. And what made it even more uh, deeply impactful for me is that during, we'll call it treatment, um, as he was, we, we called it as a team, I found out later, the crotch massage. So it actually had a name within my team of the procedure that he did. And I remember this whole time, uh, where was I taken? But I was taken back to my childhood abuse. And so... So that situation was then triggering. It was triggering a past experience. And I'll get into more of that later in this podcast. Um, but for those who are listening that may have been survivors, like when you already have a previous experience and now you're experiencing something else that brings those memories back. Now I was like on hyper, hyper alert. And I remember ever since, you know, my kid experience, I, I told myself, I, I'm not going to let that happen again. Well, we all know that we don't have control over life as much as we want to, you know, that it is a natural response to say that, but it's not reality. And so now I'm in this state of, okay, do I let them continue? Do I not? I want to get better. Like, what is this? Right. This is treatment. And being in the middle of it, not necessarily being able to process, like, I'm being manipulated. Mm -hmm. I'm being groomed for this mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. And I even remember um, the phone rang in the middle of it. And he answered the phone and he kept his hands in my pants. And I remember thinking, dude, take your hands out of my pants. You know, like, you don't have to let it be sitting in there while you're on the phone. And so in hindsight, as you've as I've replayed it a million times, you know, there's just alarms all over the place. Um, but when you're in the middle of it, you're just like I said. You 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 try to choose trust and mm -hmm. um, and what you know. And um, I I did feel a little better after the treatment, but I felt dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember leaving that thinking, what what the heck was that? And I even told my teammates. Now, something I've heard about traumatic experiences is sometimes it's natural to laugh. Maybe you've heard that in your, yeah. have you? Those different coping Coping mechanisms, because you're trying to survive and make, right. it f make yourself feel okay. And so that was something I think a lot of my teammates did. Was to laugh it off. Was to or, laugh it off and call it the crotch yeah. massage. Someone called them happy fingers. Well, I didn't know what happy fingers meant, mm -hmm. you know. 
And so uh, I even remember sharing with one of my teammates and she, and I had forgotten, you know, a few years ago until she reached out to me and she said, Lisa, I have felt guilty about it ever since then that I never did something and I, to, to, to support you in that, you know, and I said, none of us knew, you know, mm-hmm. don't carry that burden. It's not your fault. But um, it was something that was aware on our team, and I think we were all just trying to make sense of it at the time. But you all kept going back because this was something that your coaches supported. This mm-hmm. was something that maybe a doctor, he was being innovative, or he was That's presenting right. himself to be that way. Yep, to have the best treatment around or something. You know, and I just assumed that what he did to me is what he did to other people. Um, you know, and, and I saw him maybe a few more times uh, during during that year, and then fast forward. So I graduated from Michigan State. Right. So you saw him all th- like throughout for a few your- years. Yeah, and 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 now it gets fuzzy. I think I saw my senior year because I actually missed out on my senior year of play because of the back injury became uh, you know something I I couldn't I couldn't handle and play with. So I I hung it up my senior year, which was super hard. Um, we found out I had a herniated disc actually in my in my back. That I need to heal from. So um, I saw maybe a little bit my senior year, but but my next memories then come in my late 20s. So my back stuff resurfaced in my late 20s. And I was at, at Michigan State at the time because I was in my job as um, as a minister in, in uh, a sports ministry. And so I worked with the athletic department of Michigan State and I helped mentor Michigan State athletes. And um, when my back stuff surfaced again, I thought, well, who am I going to see? Right. The best of the best. Mm-hmm. And so I I remember just being elated that I got in to see him. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys, I got to see Dr. Nasser. He's actually going to take me as a patient. And so I saw him for the next uh, little over a year. And again, I remember when I went to see him and he he did the same treatment again. So he just jumped jumped right back into yeah, like where he left It wasn't off. every time. Sometimes there were just kind of uh, adjustments you know, um, that needed to be made like a chiropractic care. And then, um, but I do remember two specific times. Uh, one when, uh, he gave me a massage and I was, and I thought this isn't helping this. I I don't want him to do it again. And then, uh, there came a point where I says, you know, I, I don't want that today. I don't want that today. But, um, you know, he would talk about his involvement at church. He would talk about his family. He just presented himself as a safe, trusting, quirky man. Mm-hmm. And um, Athlete A, I thought, from from my experience with Dr. Nasser, I thought Athlete A captured what I saw him to be, you know, as my doctor. And he presented himself with like the thing, the good looking things, uh-huh. where it's like you wouldn't question. That's right. This one thing, because it's like, look at this mountain that I've built of I'm going to church and I'm this great doctor and I'm seeing all these people. Mm-hmm. I'm a good and man. And it makes it almost yeah. is trying to minimize this. Oh, well, this is a small detail of what we do mm-hmm. in comparison to what's happening. So one th- one thing I'm wondering is how did you looking back, did you see yourself like emotionally like processing or dealing with it or was it something where. You just kind of accepted it and didn't it didn't necessarily you just you put it into a box put it where into it wasn't a box. it yep. wasn't affecting like that's your a good day-to-day. way of putting it mm-hmm. i compartmentalized mm-hmm. yeah. it so as a student athlete you do what you need to do to get better mm-hmm. and then in my late 20s early 30s i think what um helped me dismiss it or minimize it this is what I realized in hindsight what I did is because he was doing so many extra things for me. Like I remember he said to me one day, Lisa, we're going to try five things. You have to fail five different attempts at treatment, all different kinds of treatment before we're going to go to surgery. And he was pulling strings for me, like like <laughs> things I, I couldn't have access to certain doctors or take home equipment he was hooking me up with for free, like all this stuff that I felt, wow, I'm He's really giving yeah, me like top notch right. privilege, mm-hmm. and it's all part of the facade. It is all part of the facade. Mm-hmm. That's what made him so slick with so many people. Is he was just that? He was just that smooth. So, um, 
you know, that my seeing him, those appointments stopped because I moved to Omaha. Okay. And, and that's where that kind of ended was um, I had actually found some other therapy outside of what he was offering that was helping. And then that just kind of coincided with, with me moving away from East Lansing, Michigan. And I just want to say, like, with when you're saying, you know, you compartmentalized it, that's also a way that, you know, when you're suffering from PTSD or you're going mm-hmm. through a traumatic experience, like your brain is like, we can't handle all these things that are going on. And I mean, it can put those feelings and emotions into a box where it's mm-hmm. like to self preserve you right. and into that survival mode. So that's a lot. Yeah. So then yeah. you move to Omaha mm-hmm. after this experience and then move to Omaha and yeah, I'm living here. I'm working at Christ Community. And uh, come 2017, I get this letter in the mail. And it's a letter from Michigan State saying that there was an investigation opened on Dr. Nassar. And if we had any um, information to share with them about our own experience as a patient, you know, anything to report to contact them. Well, that just opened up the box. So now I have you know, a, a few. It opened up that that box that yeah, was closed. Yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> literally, right, that box. And then as well as, um, you know, some other Spartan athletes reached out to me and some friends, um, you know, because now some things were in the news at the time because he, uh, he got caught with child pornography. Mm. And that's what really blew the case open because now we're like, okay, this validates that this man has some severe, you know, sexual addiction going on and, and illegal behavior. Um, How did you start processing that? Like, what mm-hmm. were your emotions when mm-hmm. when the letter came? came it had to be, and, yeah. People start reaching a wave. out. Wave, mm-hmm. overwhelming. Yeah, you you start disillusionment sets in. You're like, mm-hmm. wait a second. So the guy who I thought was this trusting <laughs> doctor, you know, fill in the blank, all the good things, is actually someone that you know, might be a predator Mm -hmm. that, um, is, is a serial child molester. Like it, it was, I, I wasn't able to fully wrap my mind around it. And then I think, um, when I was asked, are you going to report or not? So now I'm thinking about what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then you're hearing your, from your, your other teammates of Mm -hmm. their stories. So then, Mm -hmm. So then I'm thinking, now I'm comparing, and one in particular story that I heard was just heartbreaking, and I had no idea that was going on. Again, I just assumed what other people experienced was my experience, but but hers was much more invasive. And um, I thought, well, um, he hasn't, he didn't penetrate me, you know, it, it wasn't to that degree of abuse. So maybe mine isn't as bad. And so now you start minimizing. And again, that was a protective, protective response for me, because I knew if I admit, yes, I am one of those victims, you know, survivors, then that means I have a journey of healing ahead of me. And that means, um, you know, this is going to kind of stir up all the stuff of my past and my childhood abuse that it happened again. And I just didn't, I didn't want to go there and I just didn't want to allow myself to believe it, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I wrestled with it. I remember talking to a few people about it, but then that kind of subsided until the trial happened in 2018. Yes. In 2018, Mm -hmm. he went on trial and that's when the testimony started and more women coming to more women. Women and the numbers women. kept going up. I remember watching that trial because it was one of the things that was it was always on the news and it was live streamed because of the attention that it got. Mm-hmm. And it was it's just seemed like it went from like 10 to 100, 150. To, I mean, there was the number was rising. Yeah. It, you, it was just unconscionable what uh you were hearing from these women. And I remember sitting in my lazy boy chair in the living room with my phone, just watching these videos and, and, you know, crying with them and just feeling the weight and the pain of it. And then there was something inside of me that I started noticing. And it was this feeling of anger. And it was this feeling of, I, I belong in that number. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have a story too. 
Yep. And then it was, okay, Lisa, what does this mean? So I'm trying to pay attention to how I'm processing and my internal world, so to speak. And I realized all is not well within me and I need to talk to somebody. So that just kind of opened up these opportunities then for me to uh, process it with you know, one of the survivors that had reported, and that was very helpful to have a conversation. Um, and I think go we ahead. just want to say that as we're talking about this and you've said, you know, there's the comparison of this person was penetrated. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. This was my experience. This was your experience. They're different. I mean, they're different kinds of bad, but mm -hmm. they're still bad. They're still bad. They're still bad. Yeah. Your experience wasn't minimized and it wasn't nothing mm -hmm. comparing it to something else. It was still an evil thing to do to a person. And so I, I remember you talking about that, how just because one thing wasn't, you can't compare the two, but they're still, it's still an evil thing. Yeah, you think happen. one is more egregious than the other mm -hmm. or something. And then it's like, well, I, 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 I'm okay. I mean, I, mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't have to do that, go through that. Um, and that's just one of the lies that I think a lot yes. of survivors believe, and it makes me so sad, but I've been there, and I understand why we do it, and it's it's a protective thing. I really believe that um, because it's scary. It's scary to come to the place where you admit to yourself and acknowledged, I was violated in the deepest, most intimate parts of who mm -hmm. I am, and that's a scary thing. You know, because that's that you're starting to expose some shame there, Yeah. you know, and uncertainty and what are people going to think and who can I talk to? And it just leads into kind of a spiral, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so when all of this started erupted, I was just devastated and and not from my own experience. So I'm my own experience. I'm trying to process that. But the university that I love is under fire and it's all over national news. And because I'm a Spartan and proud of it, I've got people here. Yes, everyone's probably being like, like, hey, Lisa, hey Lisa, Lisa, what's up with that doctor in Michigan State? You know? What did you do? I, man. Because you're processing all this. You. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to respond and divulge anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not to most of the people that said it, because they're not, I, I don't know if they're safe. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about yes, that we'll later. Yes, we'll talk about that later. And um, not in necessarily I, your community. Mm -hmm. So they're the curious people. Yeah. So I usually would kind of respond like, it's so heartbreaking to hear what happened. And I would try to diffuse it a little bit. I wouldn't joke about it. And sometimes I would even say, you know, you never quite know the fullness of any story. So just keep that in mind, yes. you know, and I would smile. But I tried to be kind and gracious because they don't know. Mm. I think sometimes people just, you know, they're ignorant and they don't think things through. Um, but so it's all over the news. My my staff I used to work with in Athletes in Action, the sports ministry I was a part of, they're still on campus trying to serve these athletes. Those weekly at meetings State. are busting at the seams because there's all these athletes coming out needing that comfort, needing that spiritual place of saying, I mean, all the questions we're asking God, where are you? You know, how would you let this happen? I mean, all those are very natural responses to, to tragedy. And, um, it's just like the rug was taken out from under them and a shadow was cast over the place. So, I mean, I even was looking at flights <laughs> to fly out there to be with, you know, and support. Um, was that overwhelming for you to, and it, I mean, isolating. I mean, you're talking, yeah. maybe talking to friends on the phone, but you're all, you know. Kind of all Spart alone out here. Spart yeah, Spartan. Spartan alone. <laughs> That's right. In little Omaha, Nebraska. Solo we're surrounded by Huskers. Yeah. So how, what was that like? Yeah, I just I was on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have a pretty strong inner circle that I was able to talk to during the time. Um, but uh, it was a surreal, a surreal few weeks um, going through that. Another thing, we weren't allowed to reach out to any MSU athletic staff because there was an investigation. So now you're thinking about these coaches. You want to know how people are, your program. You, you can't talk to anybody. You can't talk to anybody. Um, and so that just led me to thinking through, okay, Lisa, how can I, in a healthy way, continue to walk through this? And I'm like, oh, got to talk to my therapist, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> got to get my safe people around my tribe. And that's when I started taking next steps towards that. And I remember thinking deep down, I have a lot of work to do. Yes. So tell me what your therapist said when 
you brought this up to her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd already been in therapy, so that was kind of easy. I didn't have to try and find somebody because that could be so difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was already um, in counseling uh, for some other experiences that I was walking through um, in terms of being a leader in the church and being a woman and 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 now with this, I'm like, man, being a woman sometimes is really hard, ah. <laughs> you know. And so I, I was sitting with um, my counselor, and I said, "Have you seen the news?" <laughs> and she says, "No." I try to. St- I think she might have said, "No." I try to stay away from it or something. And I I told her the story, and I said, "He was my doctor." And it's like, Jess, I didn't have to say anything else. She got it. And it's like her eyes immediately, you know, kind of missed it over. And there was this deep empathy. She didn't have to say another word. Um, and we kind of sat in that, in that understanding, that mutual understanding of what this means. And she, uh, she looked at me and I remember her saying something like, Lisa, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And we're going to get through this. And I'm going to walk with you through this. And that meant so much to me. Ugh. Like for someone just with this resolve and this strength to say, I'm with you, we're going to walk through this and it's going to be okay. I'm not, I'm going to walk with you. With you. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not like good luck with that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but, but she understands and she knew already some of my story because I, I had unpacked some of it before about my childhood abuse. So it was timing, God's timing, you know, it was time to take the next, the next step in healing. Mm -hmm. So now at this point, you were just starting to acknowledge that abuse in your in your own life with your therapist. Um, How did you process that question, whether or not you wanted to report Mm -hmm. Larry Nassar? Yeah, because at that point, um, just for your story, he was already sent. It was done. Mm -hmm. Like he had already had that sense that I shared earlier. Truth was out. 60 years, 175 Mm -hmm. years. Yeah, The judge actually said, I'm giving you your death sentence. I mean, it was done. Mm -hmm. And so some people might wonder, well, what's wonder, you know, why Lisa, what's the big deal? And I remember kind of processing this and, and talking it through again with, with, with my people. And, um, I realized that one thing I could do that would be very crucial for healing is to report because it was a way of sticking up for myself. It was a way of honoring the truth that I was sexually abused. It was a way of being able to kind of recalibrate my thinking to what to what was honest and saying, I want to be counted. Mm-hmm. I want to be in that number because of what I know that's going to mean. I want to look back 5, 10, 15 years, whatever, and say, you know what? That was one of the darkest times of my life, but God brought me to a place where I could stand up and say, Mm. no, that was wrong, and you have no right to do that. And so that was my way of, 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 as I say, kind of, it was bringing my shame into the light and taking away its power Mm. um, when I was able to to decide to report. And I even, uh, you know, in in thinking of when to report, I I was like, well, what does that look like? You know, what's the number, (laughs) who to call? Mm -hmm. And so um, someone who had already reported, I was able to talk to her and uh, she gave me the phone number of this lieutenant Andrea Munford, you see the, her. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the documentary, yeah, the, that's the person you the worked with. The lieutenant for the investigative division at Michigan State Police. Um, so I had her number, and I remember just kind of staring at the number, you know, not knowing what was on the other side. I mean, I was, I was encouraged that she seemed like a really amazing lady, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, so I, I, I got up my courage, and I called the number, and, and there was no answer. So I had to leave this message. And it's like, what do you say on someone's voicemail? I don't even remember, you know, hi, I'm Lisa Ashton, former Michigan State athlete. I'm calling to report sexual abuse. Not, mm. You know, you're just trying to gulp it out. And then um, I remember it was a Wednesday evening and uh, I was cooking chicken in the kitchen um, and just decided, oh, I, I need to check my phone. And I checked it and there was a voicemail from Michigan State Police. And I thought, oh, here it is. 
this is time. And so then it was time. It was to time. start that journey of healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Lisa, tell me a little bit more about what that phone call with the detective was like. Yes. So I I um, picked up the phone and uh, called her back, and she was doing a you know late hours that night, and. I don't know what I was expecting on the other side, mm-hmm. but I guess when you think of a detective with the police, you think they're just going to want the facts, you know, and and uh, maybe not that they'll be cold, but just kind of to the point. And um, uh, it was not that way at all with her. I mean, she was incredibly warm and down to earth and patient. Like I knew right away. She's not trying to rush me and I can have, she says, mm. Lisa, you can have all the time you need. And I'm, and I was kind of awkward in the beginning. I said, so what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? And she says, well, you know, if you're comfortable, just, just tell me about your experience and what happened. So I began to, again, recount the experience with Dr. Nassar. And it was interesting that like when I mentioned some things, some were, uh, congruent with other testimonies that but that red book mm-hmm. she the never red. heard about the red book she's like no I, I didn't even know a red I haven't heard about the red book I'm like he didn't even show the red book to anybody else you know yeah. but uh, maybe he did but that just didn't come up um, so you know I was able to to share the story and then it just kind of flowed into some more conversation and, and we had the freedom to do that because the investigation was over and so had I reported when the investigation was still going there would have been some boundaries with what she could share with me but because it was over and it was closed she had a little more freedom but you could have a yeah and so full conversation I just saw that as a gift in and of itself and something else that emerged out of this conversation that I wasn't really ready for is that um back in my 20s i had seen this creepy chiropractor um i call him creepy because he was but um i kind of got that gut sense that sometimes we get about about people about men those little red flags that come up that we can't really and it's like you have to honor that and i remember i i reached out to a friend who also saw him and i said are you feeling a little uncomfortable with this guy not that he was doing anything blatant and i'm not you know minimizing this one but it was in the context of his massages and i just felt eerie and again he was using those if you feel uncomfortable let me know and so we ended up stopped seeing him and we confronted him and said we're not we're not coming back we think you need help so I, I found out a year later he had gone to jail for mm. prison for sexual assault. So these so little I'm, triggers that are coming up. Yeah. And I mentioned that to the detective. I said, did you hear about this case? Could you look into that case for me? And she says, actually, Lisa, my partner handled that case. So here's one wow. more little piece of closure that I never would have anticipated to know. OK, so my gut was right. And this guy had prison time as well. And um, as I'm telling her my story and then telling her, you know, this happened to me as a kid, she said, wow, Lisa, you've had a lot of trauma in your life. And I had never, Jess, I had never had someone say that to me before. And I was taken back and I thought, me? Really? Especially coming from someone that's... Me? You know, and, um, and I would think probably most people who know me wouldn't guess that. And... I thought, gosh. And so you're just kind of rep, like, is this really my life? Is this really my story? Like, God, what are you doing? And so just trying to sort that out, I knew it was going to take some time. Um, but we also connected over. She happened to go to the same church that I had attended in East Lansing. And so um, we talked a little bit about that. And then towards the end of the conversation, we might have talked for a good hour. I remember um, kind of having this sense of, Lisa, maybe you should pray with her before you get off. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. You know, the last thing you want to do is come across self-righteous or pious or whatever. So I'm arguing, my, have you ever been there before? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> where you feel that nudge that you need to pray for somebody, but you don't want to f- be the weirdo that right. offers to do that. Make it uncomfortable. Yes. Mm-hmm. Un- mm-hmm. Uncomfortable. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Word of the day. Um Got it but uh, I actually picked up a pen and paper and I started writing notes about what that prayer would be. And I'm, and then in that moment, I heard Lisa, 
put the pen down and trust me. Put put the pen down and trust me, you know? And so I'm giving her my full attention now. And, um, and she was just, I can't say enough about how amazing of this woman, how amazing she is. I mean, I said, how many of these interviews have you done, Andrea? And she said, over a hundred. Wow. Over a hundred. And I thought about the love and care she was giving me on a Wednesday night when she's away from her family. And I thought, you did this over a hundred times, not to mention all the other stuff that comes with investigating something of this magnitude. I mean, this was the biggest, what I've heard, the biggest sex scandal in sports history. I was like, lady, you are my hero, you know? And I got emotional at moments, just being so grateful for her to go to bat for us. And being a safe person as Mm -hmm. you navigate through this, someone that saw you Mm -hmm. could give you some meaning and some validation of like, you have trauma. This is a lot Mm -hmm. of trauma that you've been through. Mm -hmm. And she saw you. She saw me Mm -hmm. and she gave me that time. Like I was the most important person in her evening. And that just uh, baffled me because again, I was still wrestling at that time with downplaying what had happened to me thinking, man, what happened to me was not what happened to Rachel, for instance, the the woman on the the documentary that mm, came forward and and really blew it open with the the newspaper. Um, so, you know, we get to the end, and, and then I, I remember I, I just said, "Hey, I, I don't mean to be weird, but I just feel could I could I pray with you? I'm just so grateful for what you have done for me and for so many people." And she said, "Sure," and I prayed, and when I got done, there was like this calm, this peace, and she said, "Thank you." Lisa, I haven't felt peace like that in a really long time. And I got chills and it was the sacred moment. And I knew it was a moment I would never forget because God met me there. Yes. You know, and you know what else God was doing? He was using you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of a way of me honoring you. Mm -hmm. This last year and a half for you has been exhausting. Mm -hmm. And she was able to experience, I think, the peace of God during that time. So, so that just launched me in. Yeah. So going forward, so you journey of healing, having this conversation mm-hmm. with her. What mm-hmm. did the next couple months of healing look like for you? Yeah. So that was um, that was I remember it was February twenty first of twenty eighteen, and I just remember thinking um, I need to keep my circle small, <laughs> and what I mean by that is the people that I choose to spend time with and talk to have to be my safe people Absolutely. have to be that people understand because what happens is when you're going through something that's traumatic or something that's deeply uh, painful whatever it is you know maybe a loss of some sort is that it's exhausting to continue to tell people especially when they're, how are you like that was the question I hated especially at church Lisa how are you <laughs> and I'm thinking how do I answer that mm-hmm. you know I even remember asking my counselor how do I answer that <laughs> And so it just kind of became a case by case scenario. But I made sure I, I took care of like good self care. So sleep. Well, you rest. started small with a yeah. your small group. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, what do I need? Mm-hmm. Lisa. Yeah, with with letting them know this is what's going on, being open with that, realizing, hey, I, I'm going to continue to do my job at the church, but anything extra is just going to be about me. <laughs> so you saw mm-hmm. what you needed and you started setting those boundaries mm-hmm. so that you could move forward. Yeah. So you did self-care. Yeah, so rest, nutrition, exercise was huge. Like, I, I love CrossFit. We've kind of talked about Same. it, Jess, girl. Love I know it. you love it, too. And there was actually a, a Wonder Woman life-size cutout in the gym. And so it was my thing, and they knew it. When I would come in the gym, I would take Wonder Woman with me, and I would put her where I would do my workout. And that would be this motivation for me of just saying, you're, you're going to do this, Lisa. You're, you're going to complete it. You're going to work hard. And those two, three hours a week – we're, vi- we're just some of my best hours because you can kind of detach. Yes. And exercise is so important mm-hmm. um, when you're going through something hard. You got to get those happy hormones, you know. Yes. Um, outlets. Here was something that I never anticipated. I started painting. Very weird. Like, le- no one, like, I don't paint. I don't do creative stuff. But I had this paint by numbers project I was given, which was seems so daunting because it's like little dot, little squibble here. You know, you match the number with the color. And um, 
I just started doing that and I found it therapeutic. Mm. And it was like this, this creative thing I could do to channel my brain, to focus on something I'm creating and something that's evolving over time. And it's kind of like what healing is, you know? Yep. You just do one little step, one little thing, and you keep showing up and eventually something emerges. And you, it's beautiful. Yes. And so I did that for a year. I did this painting project. And I wow. completed 119 hours and I finished it. That's but that was, my, that was my therapy. <laughs> and then, so in yeah. this, as mm -hmm. you're going through this, I mean, obviously, like, there's a lot of emotions going on, a lot mm -hmm. of tendencies. I mean, you want to isolate, like you want your group to be small. But you shared something with me that I think was really powerful What's that, that I would love for you to share about, um, you know, coming from being somebody that might might be on the outside of seeing someone that they care about that's their friend going through something hard you had a friend mm -hmm. that just invited you into something simple would you mm -hmm. just share that yeah it fishing just, yes yes yep there was a um, so simple things a we can simple do. activity where it doesn't take any mind work i don't even like fishing i don't the, the whole hook thing with the the, the fish and the gore like i can't do it but when she invited me, I thought, you know what, sitting by the edge of a lake, just looking out in the peace of that with somebody, not having any expectation of conversation was what I needed. And I think, you know, um, it's something for all of us to keep in mind when we have a friend, when we have a loved one that's going through something hard, giving them an invitation to do something simple, mundane with us can be so helpful. They might not want to, but just, you know, hey, do you want to go out for ice cream? Hey, do you want to go watch my kid's soccer game? Um, mm -hmm. Hey, do you want to go for a walk? Yeah. Great uh, example. Come on over for dinner. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we're at peanut butter and jelly, but you know, yeah. you're welcome. You're, you're invited, into chaos. You're invited into our yes. space. Yep. Yeah, that's great. That, that went so far. And um, it was those kinds of, of little things that helped me um, walk through walk through that dark time and a whole lot of prayer. I mean, I, I reached out to, to people who knew and, the, and they would pray for me. And I was in some, some small groups, a, a small group at church that was also helpful, you know, in that time. So, so going back to just real quick, I want to touch on therapy because there might be somebody mm -hmm. listening that's really connecting with what with what you're saying and maybe wants to go to therapy and that's a a great first step to maybe start processing through that it looks different for other people but what were some things that were significant for you that helped you in therapy mm. that could be helpful for other people yeah therapy was also one of my favorite hours of the week well most favorite in this way um because i felt like i could be totally me mm. i think it's so hard sometimes for a leader in the church to have that place where you can come undone, where you don't have to be filtered in how you say things. You don't have to be worried about what you say or how you process certain conflict or whatever. You can just be, I could just be Lisa. And if that meant that my emotions would get intense and I would swear, that's okay, you know? Yep. And some people might laugh at that. I mean, I, I'm not a person who swears, but let me tell you, through this journey, <laughs> I love Jesus, but I cussed a little, you know, <laughs> because it just, it brought out some very deep mm -hmm. emotions that needed to come out. Mm -hmm. You can't keep that inside. Oh. And so you can give that to God, but man, when you can do it in the presence of another person, um, my therapist, you know, she could take it. She'd be like, yes, whatever you need in this time. So so it was that kind of safe place that made it important. And I encourage anyone who's looking for a therapist, you have to find someone who you can be yourself with yeah. and um, is co you're comfortable. Another big step that, that was hard for me to, to do, but so important was I agreed to go through a workbook with her. And it's called Wounded Heart. It's by Dan Allender. And it's called um, something like uh, Hope for Adult Victims of Childhood Abuse. And that was intense to go through because it really takes every aspect of the experience of what it was like to be abused as well as post um, experience of, you know, what you might go to 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 deal with the pain, to numb, to self-medicate, to survive, you know. So physical, mental, emotional, social, all aspects of one's person. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had actually said you're familiar with the book. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You've you've actually gone through that with, with clients. 
Yes, so, these are all great ways. And I think something else is, you know, we go through a life and we might not have like, what what is a good coping mechanism for me? What are good ways to process through me? And in that space of therapy and being able to work out that trauma, mm-hmm. like you, you said before, like your therapy, your therapist walked with you. She didn't mm-hmm. just, you know, say, hey, you're doing great out mm-hmm. in the arena. She yeah. was there with you. And that, and I think that's great. Um, one thing that I think is just important to note, and they made a, a small mention of it in the um, the documentary, and I wish they could have expanded on it more, mm-hmm. is just how much our brain is affected by sexual abuse, trauma, how we want to label that. It's mm-hmm. like for a lot of people, being molested, assaulted is their first sexual experience and Mm -hmm. that steals something from every person, male or female. And uh, it affects your psyche. It affects Mm -hmm. how you conceptualize love, how you accept and receive love. Um, And so I just, I think it's, it's such an all encompassing thing that we're talking about of, Mm -hmm how it affects us. It affects, it affects us physically. It affects us mentally. Um, it affects our relationships and just, it truly is something that can steal. It steals yeah. from us. No, Jess, you, you said that so well. And I actually remember, um, a session that I was talking to my therapist about the issue of sexuality and intimate experience someday with my husband and talking through, you know, my views on intimacy with a man. And, and I remember just kind of walking through that. And that's, that's kind of scary. Cause you're like, did it affect me? How, how's this going to affect me later? And, and, and am I going to be at a place where I can trust a man mm-hmm. to to enjoy my body, you know? And what does that look like? And I remember there was a time after we kind of had had waded through that, and I looked at her and I said, "So am I okay?" <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you, know, you just want to know, "Am I okay?" Mm-hmm. And she just kind of laughed. She says, "Lisa, you're going to be just fine," mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. But it is that fear. Yes. And there's so much fear that can creep in to, okay, my first sexual experience uh, was when I was six, you know, and um, I had a family member uh, touch me in places, you know, my my vaginal area that should never happen. And so you wonder, okay, how does that shape you then going forward when that is the first mm-hmm. first framework you right. have of, of what that's like. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more of that experience later, but, um, that's so real, you know, attachment issues. Um, I, I've noticed something that, that I've had to work on extensively is boundaries. Boundaries are terribly affected knowing, um, where, where someone's healthy, even emotional boundaries and treating you physical boundaries and, and how to say no and knowing that when you say no, that's not being mean. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And so some codependency issues I've had to work mm-hmm. through being too. Being okay saying no. Being okay mm-hmm. saying no and feeling empowered to say no. So mm-hmm. those are just yes. a few things that I know that I had to process through. That's great. To transition a little bit, um, when Larry Nassar was sentenced, it was very powerful that mm-hmm. they had the survivors share a letter of story they got to confront him in that courtroom Mm -hmm. and since you were you reported i was still catching up yeah (laughs) Yeah. right so yeah i wasn't there yet yeah Yeah, you weren't there there yet yet. and you're processing through um what did that look like in your life with Mm -hmm. not being able to confront him but how did that play out with later yeah yeah so i wasn't able to give him an impact statement you know, and I think again, timing, I'm just going to trust it that it happened the way it was supposed to happen. And I was almost spared in a sense of that added stress of trying to figure all that out if I was going to want to be a part of that trial or not. So, um, 
I remember I was actually home a few weeks ago in Michigan and I was talking to my dad about doing this this podcast with you and about the the Nassar situation. I remember him asking me, Lisa, if you could say anything to him, like if you would have had a chance to talk to him, what would what would you say? And I just kind of paused and I said, you dirty bastard. Like, like that was just the first thing that came out of my mm-hmm. mouth. And again, it just shows that, you know, there's still things that you're working through and still responses that you still have. Mm-hmm. And, and that doesn't mean that I haven't forgiven him, but those are just some very natural responses that we have mm-hmm. yeah. sometimes. And so um, I was able to have a, a uh, very healing conversation with um, a man who abused me when I was a kid, who was a family member. And we've, I've mentioned that a few times already. So during my time of, of more intense healing and therapy, his name was brought up and the experiences were brought up because you need to, mm-hmm. you know, revisit that. And it was something I'd actually been praying about for the last six months was perhaps it's time for a conversation. And some might wonder, why would you even think about mm-hmm. having a conversation? Right, exactly, because for some people, that's not even safe going there. Mm-hmm. But you and your process of healing and mm-hmm. like you said in the beginning, moving towards that vulnerability mm-hmm. and, of str- and strength. Mm-hmm. And so I just didn't know when that would be because, you know, he lives far away. And I had an opportunity to do a... Uh, leadership development conference we'll call it in another city and it's that city where he lives in and so when I knew I'd be flying there in April of 2018 I knew I was like it's time to reach out to see if I can have a conversation so when I told my therapist that she immediately says okay Lisa what's your motivation for that great question you know and I said you know I think my motivation is to have some closure to be able to talk to him as an adult Granted, it was about 30 years after the fact. I had seen him various times over the years, and he has apologized to me over the years. But to be able to look at him as an adult who is going through this healing and coming to the, uh, going through a significant part of it and and say, hey, your, your behavior has affected me in profound ways over the years. And I want to share with you what that looks like. And, and to express deep emotion about the fact you not only did this to me, but several other family members who I love, several other people like this sent shock waves through our family that we still feel the loss and many aspects of loss for the last 30 years. Um, and I really wanted to be able to look at him and say, and I forgive you. Like, I release you, I, I bless you, and I knew enough about kind of some of his journey that I really believe God had brought him to a place of repentance. He had brought him to a place of restoration, and I thought, this is a good risk for me to take. And so I called my, my mom, and I said, Mom, I have a huge favor to ask you and Dad. Would you go with me? Would you go with me to have this conversation? And she agreed, and she set up the appointment. And um, he happened to be in town. And so um, I had then, gosh, I don't know, six weeks now to think about what, what I would say, say, what I would say. And we decided to go with a letter because if I got emotional, I could just read it. And so I, I took time to read it. And I remember when I when I had this window of time to to write it, I um, I was actually kind of sick and on five different medications, but with the, all the different events that had happened in the spring of 2018, that's what I had to work with. And I said, Lord, you've got to give me mm-hmm. the ability to put my mind around. I have no idea what I'm supposed to say. Inviting Jesus into mm-hmm. that space. Inviting him into that space to write that letter. So I came up with a three-page letter and I shared it, read it with my therapist, and I remember she just kind of stared at me with tears in her eyes after it was done, and she says, I've never heard a letter like that. And uh, I would say it wasn't nice, but it was loving. And what I mean by that, it wasn't nice because I wasn't trying to make him feel good. You know, mm-hmm. I think sometimes we're so worried about being nice mm-hmm. instead of being kind. Mm-hmm. I kind of learned the difference um, in counseling, but but loving that it was setting boundaries, that it was acknowledging my pain. 
um, but doing it in a way that was respectful and extending that that forgiveness at the end. So um, we we drove together. My parents and I, I remember just feeling like I wanted to throw up. Um, <laughs> and we, we got there and we sat down and I kind of just initiated the time and I prayed together with everybody and said, I have, you know, this letter to read to you. And I started crying and it took me a while to gather myself. But I think what also was emotional is that I'm sitting in between my two parents, you know, they're in their 70s. This man's in his 70s. And I'm like, you know, damn it. This is what this is what sin does. It was painful, but Mm -hmm. it was also um, one of the most redemptive moments of my life. So I I read the letter, and um, he was so respectful. His wife was with him, and tears, I mean, just Mm -hmm. like dripping off his eyelids, as as he listened, he didn't he didn't fight back. He didn't give any reasons. He just listened, and then um, when I finished, I mean, it was just silent. It was like this holy silence, and you could hear the Kleenex being pulled out of the bag, the box, and and sniffles, and we just kind of sat there, the, the five of us together. And I remember just kind of sliding the letter across the table. I'm like, do you want it? (laughs) You know, do you want it? And he picked it up. I'll never forget what he said. And his response was, this must have taken you a lot of work. Mm. Thank you. Wow. You know, only a person who has done a significant amount of work and healing would know to say that to just acknowledge the fact that that must have been really hard. And so we were able to talk a little bit and, you know, my parents asked him a few questions and he was asked, you know, at what point do you feel like you were restored? And his response was every day. Mm. And that meant a lot for me to hear that. It's just an ongoing process of God changing you and transforming you. And, um, I, I really believe, you know, that, that God has, he, that he knows Jesus, you know, that, that we're going to be together in heaven someday, and all those things. And so when I was able to end the letter and just look at him and say, I bless you with the love, peace, and forgiveness of Jesus. And um, I can look back and say, yeah, that that's the day I kind of shut the door in the face of the evil one. And I said, no, not not anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I don't give you, I don't give you access to this place of my story because I'm choosing I'm choosing forgiveness. Was that moment a pivot point or how do you how did that how do you view that? Mm. I think when we can when we can look at moments when we choose to live with an open heart, to choose to live with a, a heart that is going to um to choose the better way to forgive that adds power because it it the the, the power of shame in your life it just kind of breaks mm. you know resentment bitterness it it it, it loses its traction mm-hmm. and um for me to be able to look at him and have that moment was a freeing moment for me it was excruciating yes painful i don't want to see people i don't want to feel like I'm inflicting pain on somebody else you know but the best way I could kind of think of it was like the the cross of Christ is both excruciatingly painful and gloriously beautiful and I feel like that tension is what I experienced Mm -hmm. across the table thank you for inviting and allowing us to step into that moment with you Mm. i I just want to say that because that's a very vulnerable, intimate thing to share. Mm-hmm. And I don't take that lightly. So thank you so much for inviting us into that. I, I have yeah. a question I'd like to ask too about sure. that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, you said you chose, like it was the better thing to do, mm-hmm. but that doesn't 
sometimes the better thing or like mm-hmm. the thing you need to do is not easy. Like mm-hmm. this was very hard. Mm-hmm. And so what's the reward of saying yes to healing, even though it's going to cost you, even though it's hard? Mm. I mean, I think about who I want to become as a woman two years, five years, 10 years down the road. And I, I want to become a woman who rises above, who takes, takes responsibility, not for maybe what has been done to her for, but how my response is to it. And, um, I think the reward is living a life where you don't have these weights on you, where you've, where you have the freedom to show up fully in who you are and say, I believe that I'm a treasure. I believe that I'm worthy. I believe that I have value. And that is a reward. It is like this self-confidence, this self-worth that builds inside of you Mm. that I want as a woman, that strength that grows. And, you know, I don't think (laughs) Jesus didn't give us these, you know, instructions to forgive our forgive one another to love our enemies and to not repay evil for evil to make us miserable like he does he he says those things to give us life Amen. and when we hold on to darkness when we hold on to the pain or we just want to hold on to to blaming whatever has happened in our life on somebody or something you know that holds us back that keeps us from experiencing a lighter and brighter life that I believe Jesus wants for us. And and yes, it does take hard work. And yes, it sometimes is painful because life life is painful, you know, and you can't control sometimes what, what happens. And it's a mystery. I can't make sense of all of this. I wish it wasn't part of my story, but it is. And so I... I choose to have uh, a life where I'm going to not let it weigh me down. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm thinking of somebody that might be listening that knows somebody that's going through a hard time and doesn't know what to do. I know we talked a little bit earlier about inviting them into just what just what they're doing in life, inviting them to go fishing or inviting them into their space is what else can we do if we're listening and, it, and we don't know what to do? Invite them in. To, to people we know that are hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it depends on what the level of trust is you have mm-hmm. with somebody. Right. If you're not, if you don't think you are in that inner space of trust with them, that might look a little bit different. So maybe it's having a self-awareness of is this person in my community? Yeah, in your your place of trust. I mean, you still can invite them and be kind, but to know, hey, I'm going to give you a lot of space to just do whatever you need to do. You know, a simple question of how can I support you? If it is something you both know is going on, like Jess, if you're going through something hard and I, I found out that you are dealing with, with sexual abuse and you know, be, just be honest. Hey, is there anything? How can I support you in this time? What does that look like? They might have an answer for you. They might not. That's okay. But you've acknowledged it. Um, not doing the platitudes of trying to make reasons for things. Right. You know, Christians can sometimes just be terrible at that. <laughs> you know, there's not a Jesus band aid that you can just slap on someone's pain and call it good. Right. Um, and. There's not always this pretty little box we can wrap up and It's not. Present. And it all, to be truthful, sometimes it's the non-Christians or it's the people that don't have a faith base that are th- th- better at holding space for you and your struggle mm-hmm. and letting you be raw and be okay with being a mess. Why do you think that is? Oh, gosh. I mean, in a short answer. Mm-hmm. I think because sometimes... What can we do better as, as Christians? Christians? We have a hard time just being honest with the ugly of it. Okay. And being okay with being in the mess and not feeling like we got to tidy it up mm-hmm. and clean it up. And, well, it's not good to be angry at somebody, so I'm going to try mm-hmm. and be nice, you know. But to honor the, the offense means that I am going to take this forgiveness journey seriously and not be so quick just mm-hmm. to flippantly say the quote-unquote mm-hmm. 
biblical thing to yeah. say. So what I'm hearing you say is instead of giving the chapter verse, mm-hmm. living it out, living it out, I'm love. reading it, internalizing it, and I'm treating yeah. you out of that mm-hmm. is sometimes what we need to do. I will, I will be with you. Yeah. Hang out, sit with you in a room, watch a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, just let you be you on your own timetable in your own space. Um, another question you can ask someone that is helpful if they want to answer is to say, how have you seen this affect you? And so allowing them to give voice of their experience and how they've seen it affect them without interrupting, without judgment, without your own little commentary mm-hmm. and just listening. How has this affected you? I'm so sorry. You know, Is there anything more you want to share? And you are sharing a lot of characteristics of a safe person, mm. someone that can va- will validate and listen and over long, a longevity that you, that person that's hurting is able to see integrity and that they're not going to leave. And um, what for you was a safe person in that time or what, do, what would a safe person look like for you? In that time, mm-hmm. uh, I think a lot of what I found in in my therapist and found in my or in in the lieutenant Andrea that I talked to, and in some family members too, and some close friends, and it's basically just letting me be me, mm-hmm. and trying to do normal things, <laughs> not trying to dig too deep, mm-hmm. and validating stuff, you, validating my mm-hmm. experience, um, and again without judgment. Um, they're that's patient. Mm-hmm. They don't judge. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm thinking of the person that might be listening that doesn't have that safe person. And so what we're talking about is like these are good characteristics to seek out in someone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think about um, you know just looking for ways to inspire hope in them and saying you're, you're going to get through this. It is going to get light again. It may mm-hmm. feel dark, but um, th- we'll get to the other side. Mm, I'm not going to leave you alone. And just as we're starting to wrap up, mm-hmm. not everybody's healing looks the same. Mm-hmm. Lisa, your story is full of pain and heartache and triumph and strength and God doing mighty and powerful things in your life and someone else's story will maybe look almost the same, but a little different. Mm -hmm. And all of our stories look different. And so our journeys of healing are going to look different. So there might be the temptation to hear you and to say, well, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not, Mm -hmm. I'm not to that place that she is. Like she's Mm -hmm. done all this work and she's had, well, she was, she went to therapy and she started doing this. It's like, there is hope. It's never too late. And I think of, um, the verse in Isaiah 43, um, where it says, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in a wasteland. That's Isaiah 43, 19. Mm. And I, I thought of that as we were talking because, um, God is always able to do a new thing. He is. He can take that hurt and that brokenness and the years. I mean, you said there's years that you have had this as part of your life and he's doing a new thing. He's Mm -hmm. using you to tell your story. And so I just hope that anyone listening just feels that hope and knows that hope is there that the Lord can always do a new thing. He can always take, take that. Yeah, what are you gonna say? Um, sorry, I. That that's beautiful. He he indeed can always do a new thing, and it's important to remember that. I, I loved how you said it. Everyone's story is different, and mm-hmm. your journey looks different. And what I have, I am learning more and more is that God is so patient with us, and He knows the speed or the pace at which how to unfold things that we need to look at. Mm-hmm. Like if, if God would show you or me all our issues at once, like oh, we, I'm on the floor, like we would drown. Yes. Like we won't <laughs> want to get out of bed in the morning, mm-hmm. but he's patient to say, okay, now let's look at this. 
okay, Lisa, maybe you're now ready for this. And for anyone listening, you don't have to have a checklist to check off all the stuff because God knows you. And, and I believe that he's bringing you along a path that will help you incrementally deal with what you need to deal. And, and, and your job is just to pay attention mm-hmm. and to join God in whatever you feel that and to invite people to help you understand what that might be. Help people to look at your life and, and give you that counsel. I mm-hmm. needed so much counsel. I was lost. And those are great next steps of maybe finding your safe person, finding your community. Mm -hmm. Maybe your first step is admitting that it happened. That is the biggest first step. Talking to God about it. Mm -hmm. Knowing what a safe person looks like. And if they're in your circle, sharing that, if that's the right thing to do. Maybe it's saying, hey, I need, I've never talked about this and I can't talk to anybody. I know I need to seek counseling Mm -hmm. and that's where I need to go. There's many different first baby steps, baby which are big steps. Baby steps are not necessarily baby steps. That's right. They're significant. They are huge. Every step is significant. So, well, Lisa, thank you for sharing today. Do you have Mm any thing that maybe we didn't cover or any closing thoughts that you would like to leave us with? You know, something that I was thinking of sharing uh, was this moment I had, and it was actually the day that I talked to my therapist and told her for the first time, you know, hey, did you read the news? That's my doctor. And we had that moment of knowing together, you know, that that a, a journey of healing was coming. So I left town that day. So I was like, I, I need to get out of here. And I went with a friend to Kansas City, and um, we just you know, stayed overnight there. And I remember um, in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep. And we had been given separate rooms because the hotel screwed up on our reservations. And so it was just just me and God in the middle of the night, and I couldn't sleep. It was like everything had just blown wide open, and I didn't know what to do with all of it. Um, This new news and just feeling so betrayed, so disillusioned, so confused, so sad. It was just so heavy. And uh, I decided to pull out, you know, those Gideon Bibles in the hotel. <laughs> Never use them. I'm like, oh, I can use a Gideon Bible today. <laughs> and I turned to a passage in, in Isaiah. It was actually Isaiah 53. And it was just a, a, a chapter of, of this prophet foretelling the death and suffering of Jesus. And it might sound morbid, but when I was just spending some time in that chapter, reading and reminding myself again what Jesus has gone through. Here is a man that's very acquainted with suffering. He's very acquainted with grief. He was oppressed, and he knew shame. He took our shame. And so I don't know how else to describe it other than that moment of feeling this assurance that the presence of God was with me and that I didn't have to be buried by the shame, that he took care of it and there would be victory on the other side. And so I think of that moment that God met me. And for people listening today, I really believe God wants to meet you in moments. I don't know what those look like, but talk to God, ask for them. And and maybe maybe you, you don't have a relationship with God or that whole area of faith is fuzzy to you and confusing. You know, just take this time as an invitation to explore. And say, hey, God, are you out there? Can you help me with this? And I believe he'll meet you. And some of the things that were most impactful to me in the journey that I appreciated hearing were, Lisa, it's not your fault. Mm. And so to the listeners out there, it's not your fault. Mm. Whoever chose to violate you sexually, physically, that was their choice. It's their responsibility end of story. And so it is so freeing to come to a place and say, it's not my fault. And to not quit, keep going over the scenario a million times. What could have I done differently? What should have I known? You know, also to know that you're not alone. I mean, when I watched that documentary, I saw tons of women. I saw their courage. I cheered them on and to know, man, if they can do it, I can do it too. And I want you to know there's hope out there that there have people that have gone before you that have blazed this trail. 
and that there is support and Christ community has support for you. Um, there are resources for you and this experience doesn't have to define you and it doesn't have to slow you from having a, a healthy, fruitful, vibrant life. That's amazing. Lisa, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your story. Mm, thank you. Well, I just want to say a thank you to whoever's listening that has journeyed with me, that has prayed for me. Maybe you, you knew something was going on in 2018, but you didn't know what, and now you do. Thank you for praying for me. I just feel so, uh, so held up, so to speak, by the love of, of, of people here and um, my family and friends. So I'm deeply grateful, and this is a, this is a day of joy for me. It really is. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. So glad to have you today. Jess, that had to be very difficult. Um, thanks for doing it. I know that mm -hmm. had to be emotionally taxing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to watch uh, Lisa share with you and like, um, I mean, not, I wasn't even in the room, but I could like feel the oxygen leave the room. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. And I think the first thing that came to mind for me is just, if this was my child or my sister or whatever, mm -hmm. and people didn't believe them, like, and you look at this documentary when there were like 500 victims and to think that people mm -hmm. wouldn't believe them, mm -hmm. um, it just speaks to the fact that we need to listen to victims when they're telling us something happened. We need to respect that and, and defend them and uh, really appreciate the way you handled that and Thank the you. conversation that you guys had. It, it was, it was really powerful. Yeah, it's good. I mean, Lisa didn't just like pop up out of nowhere on here. <laughs> I know you've been doing a lot of work. Spend some time together. Uh, you and her are spending time processing mm -hmm. through this. So yeah, thanks for the work mm -hmm. there, Lisa. Absolutely. Thanks. It was an honor mm -hmm. to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, the work, Lisa, for sharing that. I know mm -hmm. for me, I got to work with Lisa for mm -hmm. a number of, of years and always had a great respect for her and, and all that, um, but didn't know, you know, this part of her story mm -hmm. until um, until she, she reached out to us and said she wanted to process it and, and share it. And um, and so that's a that's a powerful thing that she, mm -hmm. she did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's going to be people listening all over, you know, there's going to be people that have been victims, people that would label themselves victims, people that would label themselves survivors. There good could be people that unknowingly mm -hmm. or ignorantly are just perpetrators mm -hmm. or knowingly are perpetrators. And, and you haven't labeled yourself that yet mm -hmm. um, or are on your way there. And so mm. it's a, it's a big topic, a big issue. I know we've even had a lot of, difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations on this podcast. We had conversations with a, a, a another person I worked with who was a pastor that had a, a sex addiction, porn addiction, and we were able to work through that with uh, some professional counselors through City Care, which we were so blessed to have. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in that, or maybe that's you, or you want to hear a, a male perspective as not a perpetrator, but someone that's, you know, been on the other side of that episodes 21 and 22 are, are things that might be interested of you or to share with somebody who's on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. I know PTSD is another thing she talked about, um, which still in, in our world, I think it's labeled just, Hey, it's those people that were in the military. They came back, but how much all encompassing PTSD can be and how much it really does damage in our lives and mm -hmm. we oftentimes just don't even recognize you know we don't walk around with that as a label mm -hmm. and you you shared something too about that whole label thing and, and how people were responding to her rachel uh, mm -hmm. as we talked about people's excitement oh you went to michigan state mm -hmm. and so yeah and i just think personally for me this episode has given me a little more awareness of like people that i'm around of just thinking you see it on the news you see these documentaries and it's so easy to just keep it on the screen yeah. and mm -hmm. kind of keep it over there and be like wow those people are really struggling with that like that is so hard but i think hearing lisa's story and just realizing how close to home like this is happening and this is all around just makes me want to have more awareness with people that i'm around who i don't know their 
story. I don't know what they've been through. And like, yeah, not making silly comments like, oh, wow, did you hear what happened? You know, like, I don't even know what they could have been through. Um, So just that's a personal step that I just feel like I want to kind of start taking. So like we said earlier, uh, City Care Counseling is a great resource that we have here. Uh, You can learn more about that if you're interested at citycarecounseling.org. But yeah, this is a really uh, difficult subject to get through. Um, And so it's good to kind of process it with you guys. Um, Thanks again, Jess. Thanks to Lisa for your time and coming in to do that. We really appreciate that. And thanks to all of you who are listening. Uh, That does it for this week. If you want to reach out to us, though, you can do that on social media at CCC Omaha, or you can send us an email to uh, podcast at cccomaha.org. We'd love to hear from you, hear your input, your ideas, criticisms, whatever that may be. Until next time, we'll talk to you then.